Thanks for coming. Cool. Well, thank you. Um, I'm Liam. Uh, this is talk about Proto Galaxy. It's not like super technical. I don't know. Um, feel free to like ask questions if something is unclear or you want me to go into more detail. Um, yeah. So Proto Galaxy's joint work with Ariel Gabazon, um, and uh, it's being used by Aztec for their um, proof system. So. That's cool. It's being being used in production. Um, yeah, uh, I work at Alpen Labs uh, and other places. So, um, okay. So, uh, I want to motivate the discussion a little bit of folding schemes in case people aren't familiar or have just sort of heard of them because they've been kind of in the air and, you know. Um, so, hopefully, everybody's heard of snarks. Um, people call them zero knowledge proofs, um, but a snark is a succinct, non interactive argument of knowledge. Uh, so, what does that mean? Well, we have some relation, R, uh, between X and W, public inputs and some witness. So, you could imagine R being uh, extremely generic, right? Any, any kind of statement in NP where that is efficiently checkable. Um, Usually we describe R with like an arithmetic circuit, so like uh, R1CS or Planckish relation or something like that. And then the goal of a snark is, um, yeah, so sometimes we add other stuff, right? Like lookups or other types of gates. But the prover wants to convince the verifier, so there's this kind of game between a prover and a verifier, that they know, they know a W for a particular X. Um, so we fix this relation, and the prover wants to convince the verifier they know W, maybe without revealing anything about W, in which case it's zero knowledge, or uh, maybe just using uh, a proof, like pi. And uh, if the prover can construct a proof pi that the verifier accepts, it should follow that they know some witness with overwhelming probability. Um, and this proof should be much smaller than W, um, <clears throat> which is what we mean by succinct. Sometimes people also mean that the proof is efficiently checkable um, by succinct. Uh, there's subtly different notions. So for example, bullet proofs is not efficiently checkable in the sense that it takes time linear in the size of W to verify, um, whereas something like Roth 16 takes a constant amount of time to verify. But um, by succinct here, it's, it's fine to just mean that it's, it's smaller than W. Um, so there's like lots, lots of different types of snarks. Um, there's not one like correct snark for all applications. And uh, that's part of the fun, but also a little frustrating. Um, they trade off between things like prover, verifier time, proof size, security assumptions, um, trust, trusted setup. Um, uh, yeah, so, so for example, Starks will have a really fast prover, but they'll have like a big proof versus Groth 16 will have a trusted setup and it will have a, a relatively less performant prover. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so they use different things like hashes or pairings, or quantum resistant and whatnot. Um, but there's one important distinction between types of snarks that I think uh, or that makes sense to focus on for this talk and this topic, which is monolithic versus incremental snarks. <clears throat> so snarks like Groth 16 and Planck and Starks, uh, the term Stark is sort of overloaded to refer to lots of different things. But in the original sort of conception, Starks are monolithic. And what, what I mean by that is like the prover has a witness for their relation, and they just generate the proof all at once. Um, it's a little hand wavy, but it, it, it sort of makes sense, especially in contrast with incremental snarks. So um, one practical issue that arises here is if your witness is very, very, very large, right? Suppose you have a ZKVM and you're generating a proof for a trace of a very large program. then Reading the whole witness and generating the whole proof all at once might not be feasible to do on a single machine. So 
we would like, and people do, split up proof generation into sort of chunks. And they do each chunk maybe independently and then recombine them. Or they do each chunk incrementally and then combine them. So the insight of incremental SNARKs, which, by, which includes things like IVC, incrementally verifiable computation, and proof carrying data, is that we can recursively verify proofs in other proofs. So you can define like a relation where the like witness is another proof. And so you can prove that you know a proof for some other relation. Maybe you could prove that you know multiple proofs for another relation. And this lets you compress proofs arbitrarily. There should be like a, you know, inclusion there. <coughs> um, this works more or less exactly as you'd expect, as long as the verifier for the proof is smaller. So remember, I mentioned the bulletproof verifier is linear in the size of the witness. So naively, if you tried to do this with a bulletproof, each time you recursed, the statement that you're proving would get larger, and this would not kind of uh, converge. Um, but with something like Roth 16, it's totally fine. You can recursively verify a Groth proof. It's a constant size. No problem. Starks also. The proof is polylog, so it's fine. <clears throat> um, there are two kind of extremely similar formalizations of, of this. Uh, incrementally verifiable computation, where you have like one, the, the, I kinda, like the original framing is like, suppose we wanted to prove something that took an extremely long amount of time. And you wanted to make sure that you didn't like make an error 500 years ago in your 1,000 year computation. So the idea would be you construct the proof slowly as you go. And proof carrying data, which is instead of just proving a linear thing, you have a graph. And you compose the proofs along the edges of the graph. But it's not really important for the talk. Um, so uh, this works, but recursive verification is expensive. Um, uh, in many cases, especially for like elliptic curve based proof systems, it might be prohibitively expensive. Um, so we might ask, can we do better than recursively verifying a snark? Um, this motivates the, the idea of accumulation schemes and the later folding schemes. So the interface that we're working with is suppose we have two proofs for some relation. And we want to combine the proofs into a new kind of object, a new proofy kind of object, uh, such that if the new object is valid for some definition of validity that I have not specified yet, then it should be the case that the original two things are valid with overwhelming probability. So that way, we can just check the validity of the new kind of thing instead of checking the validity of both of the original things. <clears throat> It'd be kind of vague here, but there's like different ways you can define things. But the shape of this is basically the same. Um, then ideally, this combination operation, or you might call it like folding to proofs, um, should be simpler to check than the validity of the objects themselves. Um, and if that's the case, then we will have devised a new way to combine proofs uh, without recursively verifying them. Um, so there's like probably tens of papers in this like line of, of work uh, that I believe starts with Halo. Um, <clears throat> and then there's like a bunch of accumulation scheme papers, BCLMS, and then there's NOVA, which is the folding scheme, introduces the notion of folding schemes. There's tons of different folding schemes, you know, Hypernova, Protostar, Protogalaxy, um, et cetera. Uh, and as you go forward in time through these papers, the combination operation becomes simpler to check and includes larger classes of relations. Um, so HALO requires running the bulletproof prover every time you combine two objects. Whereas NOVA 
does not. But it requires, say, committing to like this vector of error terms, and it includes only R1CS. And then, then hypernova includes a larger class of arithmetizations and requires running some check and, and so on. <clears throat> so um, yeah. So folding schemes have like the simplest combination operation, which is called folding, um, unsurprisingly. And uh, the way this works is you define a relation that we, we're going to fold. And then we define a relaxed or randomized relation that is the output of the folding operation. Um, and the folding operation interface is it takes, you know, it, you can define this either generally for arbitrary n and m, or you could build it out of a binary operation that folds in different orders. Um, but it just combines elements of these relations into a new single element of the randomized relation. And um, you notice that like this does not depend on n and m. So you can fold lots of things together and get one thing of constant size out. <coughs> um, This? Yeah. So it's saying like you have mult you have n instances of a relation and m instances of a randomized relation, and we can fold them all together. So it's it's gonna take them and maybe there's like binary operation that folds them individually, or maybe you can do it in one shot. You just have like a an operation that's defined over n and m. Um, but yeah, so like if this was a recursive proof system you might recursively verify each of these things to generate a new proof. Whereas here, we're going to fold them. Um, I haven't actually defined what folding is, but that's what it does. Uh, yeah. So the wave. Sorry, mm. Mm. Should the left hand side be both? I think that that, so by R ran to the M, it's like, you know. Can everybody read that? So, so I mean, in a, this would subsume that, right? Like the R R rand to R rand. is the same as. Right. It's just like a notational thing. Um, hmm. Okay. So the way folding schemes work is that they, it's very hand wavy, but they take like linear combinations of proofs. Rather than recursively verifying a whole proof, what we're going to do is have two proofs, <laughs> take a linear combination of them, and then handle all of the error terms that arise as a result of that. Um, and the point of all of this is that we only have to verify the linear combination of commitments rather than linear combination of witnesses. Okay. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about protostar style folding, which is what ProtoGalaxy uses. And uh, yeah, so protostar uh, folds any system of degree D polynomial equations, and it also folds interactive protocols. So I won't talk much about the second part, but if you're interested, you can find me later. We can read the paper. Um, so like concretely, what, what does this mean? Well, so like we could, we could define, for example, R1CS using this kind of 
formulation where we have like our polynomial f over some witness, which is like a. Right. This is just the system of polynomial equations. So the protostar style folding includes R1CS, say. And CCS is, is a sort of generalization of this, where here we have like each component of this times each component of this minus this. So if you were to generalize it to some other polynomial, you would say like Say that, that that's the CCS formulation, where instead of just a product, you replace it by an arbitrary degree D polynomial that acts row-wise on the results of the matrix multiplications with the witness. Say, um, so if that's helpful, that's that's like a concrete example of such a function. Um, okay, so. In proto-galaxy, the way we define things is we have some witness w, we write it omega, and then we have an instance or a commitment to the witness, which we write phi in the protocol. <coughs> and phi is our, I think I wrote x in the slides, but x is like the commitment to w. So in this, there's like multiple rounds with the different randomness, but we can ignore that and just think about a simple example where we have one commitment to one witness. And this witness should satisfy, say, F here. Um, <clears throat> and we define the relaxed relation as, so like we have, this is X, W should satisfy F W equals zero. And then in the relaxed case, we extend this to have F of W equals E for some E to be defined in a minute. Yeah. Okay. So how do we fold? We have W, which is F is zero on, we have a commitment to W, X, and we want to fold some XW with some element of R rand. Um, th these, this technique is, is like very old. Um, it's, it's used all over the place, but uh, the basic idea <coughs> is we define a polynomial, so this should be W prime, by the way. So we, we want to define a line through our two witnesses. We have L of t is equal to 1 minus t times w plus t times w prime, where So we have this line. This line, when we evaluate it at zero, this term will go to one, because one minus zero is one, and this will go to zero, so it equals w. If we evaluate it at one, we get w prime. So it interpolates between w and w prime. Now we can define the polynomial capital G of t equals little f, which is the same f from over here, this one of these, equals L of t. 
So if f is of degree d, l is of degree 1, this is a degree d or univariate polynomial in t. f is like a big multivariate thing. This is like we've restricted it to a single line. Because of this, we get that g of 0 is equal to f of w, which, because xw is an r, should be 0. Likewise, g of 1 will give us f of w prime equals e, because this or e prime is an r rand. So if the prover is honest, <coughs> then g will equal 0 times 1 minus t plus e prime times t. That's a terrible t. Plus t times t minus 1 times some quotient t. And uh, this is just some simple algebra tricks. But to see why, right, if you evaluate both sides at 0, this should be 0. This goes to 1, we get 0. This is 0. This also goes to 0. We evaluate at 1. This goes to 0. This goes to e prime, which is what we want. And this goes to 0. <coughs> so this is the honest prover case. And uh, the prover will send g to the verifier. And the kind of important point here is that the verifier can now pick some randomness r from the field. And we can construct a new element of r rand. How? We can define w star equals 1 minus r times w plus r times w prime, which is just equal to L evaluated at r. And then x should be a commitment to w. And this is sort of the crucial point of folding schemes. You can compute the commitment to w star without using only x and x prime. Because x should be a commitment to w, x prime should be a commitment to w prime. So that means that x star equals commitment to w star is going to be equal to 1 minus r times commitment to w plus r times commitment to w prime, which is just equal to 1 minus r times x. So here I've taken w. This is if x star w star is part of a valid relation, then this holds. And here I've taken w star and replaced it with this expression and taken advantage of the linearity of the commitment scheme. So our commitment scheme has to be linear for folding schemes to work. It must satisfy that. Um, so KZG commitments, um, Pedersen commitments satisfy this property. Uh, Fry commitments, Merkel commitments do not. Uh, there are ways to work around that. But <coughs> um, yeah, so x star, we can write x only in terms of x and x prime. And this is what the verifier will check to verify the folding was done correctly. They'll check that x star is equal to x times 1 minus r plus r times x prime. <coughs> um, OK. And then to complete the instance of r and 
we need an E star. What will E star be? Well, we have W star, which is equal to L times R. G of L R is equal to F. Uh, oh, no, that's, that's just G of R. I guess what I should say is like this. E star must equal F star. F of W star. W star is L of R. And so this means that we have F of L of R. And F composed with L is just G. So this is our new randomized instance that we constructed from these two original objects. Um, and the soundness proof is, is not like that bad. Um, it, sh it follows that uh, if this is a valid randomized instance, then both of these belong to their respective relations with overwhelming probability. OK. So now, this is all protostar, but how do we, uh, I'll write that somewhere else. There is a problem. The problem is that G does not take on <laughs> elements in the field. It actually takes on vectors because F. I think I wrote. Oh, okay. I'll write it over here. F takes on vectors. So that means that G is like a degree D polynomial in vectors. And that's a problem. We would like to. Yes. This? It's just some polynomial. We know that it, like, if, huh? In what structure? Um, so G is defined like this. If G satisfies these equations, then Q exists, and Q is a polynomial. So like the prover could either send G or they could send Q. Q is like a slightly smaller. Yeah, it's like a quotient. It's uh yeah, you could think of it as like the quotient of G by this vanishing polynomial. And one of the contributions of Proto Galaxy is generalizing from lines to other kinds of interpolations. So here we're interpolating between two witnesses, right? But suppose we wanted to interpolate between n or k, or I don't think I use k anywhere, k witnesses. <laughs> then these polynomials are like Lagrange polynomials. And we can replace them with other kinds of Lagrange polynomials. So in Proto Galaxy, we, we replace them with, say, the univariate Lagrange polynomials. And then this polynomial becomes the vanishing polynomial for those Lagrange polynomials. So this kind of ends up looking like, you know, right? And then, there. Hmm. like that. Um, it also works with multilinear polynomials, um, but it's you know sufficient, I think, to just consider the binary case for explanatory purposes. Um, yeah, I guess this is just an equivalent way of writing this. 
Um, right. Okay. So we want to take this protocol and avoid needing to send vector valued polynomials. We would like to send scalar valued polynomials. So there was a talk on MOVA earlier, which is, just does the same thing as ProtoGalaxy here. And so, <clears throat> or a very closely related thing. Um, the trick is basically to just take a random linear combination of the Gs. Um, so we have our F right over here. F is like this. We could define like a new F, like F tilde or something, that takes M plus log N variables to one field element. So here we're outputting N field elements. Here we're going to output only one field element. And we define F tilde. in terms of some beta and w. w is the same as this w. And it will equal um, system of equations. This is a single equation where we take a, if we pick a random beta, we take a random linear combination of the fi's by these pow i of beta. And pow i of beta, the definition isn't super important. The point is just that they're random. If you pick random beta, then they are all randomly distributed. So if for random beta, we have f tilde beta w equals zero, then with high probability, we have that f of w equals zero. So this reduction by itself is probably not that surprising, right? Taking random linear combinations of things to show that they're all zero is a very, very classic strong trick. Um, but it does now present the problem. Um, these pow i betas are defined thusly. We want pow i of beta, beta squared, beta to the four to equal beta to the i. That's why it's called pow, because it sort of returns the power to the i. And the way we define this is very similar to the EQ function, if you've seen from some check-based protocols. Um, it's a product of log n factors. So if you work out the algebra here and you evaluate it on these things, it will return beta to the i. Um, these are all of log degree. So this is a problem. Because if you were to naively attempt to fold f tilde, your folding algorithm would no longer be linear time. Um, so the I guess the, the main contribution of Proto Galaxy is basically like setting it up like this and then saying that you can fold it in linear time. Because the there is a sort of series of revisions of Proto Start. And in the earlier versions, the folding algorithm, I believe, was not linear time. It, it ran in like log time or n log n time. <coughs> and so Proto Galaxy does it one way. Protostar does it a different way, um, folding this, this uh, check. And um, the details of it are probably not worth going into, but the final level here, I think I've worked out. So, 
and that. This is all the same stuff that were over there, right? And uh, I just dropped the zero term here. Um, yep, yeah. and so we define our W star, E star, thusly. X star is defined as the commitment to W, like that. That's um, like I was saying, our Q here, or G, equivalently, like we were talking about a minute ago, generalizes the error curves of NOVA. Um, and especially for higher degree E's, this, this really is a problem because it would be like. N polynomials of degree D, which would be very expensive to commit to. Um, yeah, so we take the random combination of constraints. We can find this like F tilde or G, random beta. Yeah. That's the idea. That's, that's the rough idea. This is the definition of the tau function. We add this beta to the accumulator, define this as beta i. And so the folding will proceed in two steps. Um, we're going to first like fold the betas and then fold the witnesses. Um, I think that how much time is there left? Okay. Yeah, I don't know if I have time to get into that, but I can talk about it more if people are interested in it. Um, yeah, so this is getting to like the end of what I prepared. Um, Protostar uses a different check. There's like a nice family of protocols like that range from this POW I version to the Protostar version, and uh, they have different trade offs. And in particular, the Proto Galaxy version, we have log beta elements that are added to um, the public part of the accumulator, whereas in Protostar they store only two group elements. Um, so their accumulator, or their, their like x, is constant size, um, but it requires more group operations to fold. In certain, like to, to check that you folded correctly. Um, another thing that <coughs> I think it's underappreciated about the protostar style of protocols is the flexibility in the relation. So, like F, I gave two like kind of example Fs here, but it, it really can be anything, like any degree D polynomial. Um, and uh, that means that you are not bound by the sort of normal snark arithmetization constraints, like organizing into columns and rows and having the same thing applied uniformly as a Planck or uh, the matrices. Um, and a lot of like variations in protocol become um, prover optimizations. So, for example, um, in many cases, your witness will have large pieces of it that are zero, say. Um, this would be like the uh, supernova style stuff, which is discussed in the latter part of Protostar. Um, if large chunks of your witness are zero, then it might be the case that without changing sort of the protocol at all, just using a different F, you can get the benefits of, um, I'm forgetting the name. So supernova style folding, like with different subcircuits, you only have to pay the cost of the subcircuit that you're using. That doesn't require changing the protocol, it just requires changing how you compute G. Um, this is also stuff that, that Aztec does to some extent. Um, and one really interesting new direction that this line of work has gone in like the last couple of days is uh, this new ARC paper from um, Benedict and Pertuch and Wilson, and I think there's another author, but I don't remember. Um, uh, yeah, so they're able to use non homomorphic commitment schemes. So here, right, I said we compute x star by taking this linear combination of commitments. 
this check conceptually could be generalized. Rather than taking the linear combination directly, it would be sufficient given three commitments to have some way of arguing that x star is a linear combination of x and x prime. One way you could do that is if you have a homomorphic commitment scheme to just take the linear combination of the commitments. Another way to do it is if you had sort of Fry style Merkle commitments, you can read, say, a subset of positions in the tree and check that they satisfy a linear combination. And it's possible to argue that if that is the case, then x star is a valid linear com a valid commitment to a linear combination of x and x prime. Um, the more recent work is able to alleviate some sort of technical issues with the previous accumulation without homomorphism paper, where this linear combination check from accumulation without homomorphism only works with sort of log depth. You can only do it so many times. Um, and that's what's addressed by the article. But in any case, the like folding part, or the intuition around the folding part has been very similar, I, I believe, or at least it was with accumulation of polymorphism. Um, they're just generalizing this linear combination check. Um, lattice fold does a different kind of generalization for lattices. Uh, and they use hypernova instead of protostar. But um, yeah, this kind of generalizing to non-homomorphic, and like lattice commitments are kind of homomorphic, but not you know, in the same way that elliptic curves are, depending on the commitment scheme. So yeah, I haven't talked about that part. Yes. Uh, so if you use another commitment scheme, mm -hmm. is that the commitment also should be expressed inside the circuit? Yes. So instead of you, you want to have this check, the check that th these satisfy the linear combination, that's what would be recursively verified. So for elliptic curves, that's checking some elliptic curve scalar multiplications. For um, Merkle trees, that's checking some subset of the leaves. You have to do that in circuit. And for lattices, uh, I don't actually remember what they do, but it's something of that same sort of thing. So which kind of uh, check do you think is have the lowest the cost in circuit? Hmm? Which kind of check do you think have the lowest the cost in Oh, good question. So, um, there's two ways that one could answer that. Uh, the first is that this is like the elliptic curve version, I should say, requires only two elliptic curve scalar multiplications, um, which depends only on the security parameter, which is like the bit length of the elliptic curve field. The um, accumulation of that homomorphism style recursive check depends both on the depth of the Merkle tree and the security parameter. Um, I think roughly you have to do like O of lambda queries into the tree, and the, each query has like O and O of log n hashes. So it's like O of lambda versus O of lambda log n. However, proving in elliptic curve based systems is more expensive, like just the committing to things. So, in like the hash based scheme, while you're doing asymptotically more work to verify the recursive linear combinations, it might be cheaper to prove in practice. Um, I don't I don't know. I think it's I think it's probably an open question, which is actually the most concretely efficient. But I believe both the lattice and Merkle tree based schemes are more like asymptotically expensive than the elliptic curve. Yeah, that, that's all I have. So.